Welcome back, chillers. I'm Amber, and if you're here, you know it must be Tuesday, and this is another episode of True Crime and Chill. Alex is out this week. She'll be back just as soon as she's feeling up to it. If you feel so inclined, pop over to our Facebook group page or to our YouTube channel and give her a little shout out. I know she'd love to hear from you. This week, I'm bringing you a case I stumbled across while watching one of my new favorite YouTube channels, Faces of the Forgotten. In it, the gentleman visits graves across the United States and shares their stories. From unique grave sites to true crime stories, he always shares with lots of sympathy and knowledge. He also has a Patreon where he uses the money to purchase gravestones for those he comes across that may not have one. In May of 2021, he went to visit the grave of Michelle Morgan in O'Fallon, Illinois, and sadly, there were no flowers or anything on the little girl's grave. I will have the video about this case that he made linked on our website, truecrimeandchill.com. His channel is definitely worth a look. I realized not enough people may know her story, and I wanted to get it out there because it's important, because mothers who purposely hurt their children, especially to the point of death, are unacceptable and never should be allowed to walk free. So, friends, let's discuss the life and death of Michelle Morgan. It starts, really, in 1995. George Morgan was working on his 45-year sentence for a series of crimes, including rape, in Jefferson City, Missouri. He decided to research his family's history and genealogy and requested a copy of his little sister's death certificate. Michelle had died on August 10th of 1961 at just four years old. The cause of death was listed as viral pneumonia, and the death certificate also had a date of January 29th of 1976. George knew this to be untrue as he remembered the events of the afternoon of August 9th, 1961, so he decided to write the funeral home to let them know that the certificate was incorrect. In his letter, dated August 21st of 1995, he says that the findings were incorrect. He said that when he was eight and a half years old, his sister was murdered, and he watched it happen. This letter was turned over to the office of Rick Stone, the coroner in St. Clair County, Illinois. Rick Stone recalls being skeptical. He said it's difficult to want to trust random letters from a convict. However, he decided to pursue it. He wrote back to George, and they corresponded for a while before he contacted the Illinois State Police to investigate. On January 31st of 1996, Rick Stone, accompanied by Detective Kurt Slackleben, went to speak with George in person. George tells the story that when he was eight and a half years old, he lived with his half-sister in western Illinois. They shared a father, Bill Morgan, who was in the Air Force. He was an airman and was stationed at Scott Air Force Base. The kids stayed home all day with their new stepmother, who was from Scotland. Her name was Mary Morgan. George says he watched Mary beat his sister, Michelle, and it hadn't been the first time, but this time on August 9th would be the last. He says that he remembers Mary scolding Michelle outside their Illinois farmhouse because she believed Michelle had lied to her. He said that Michelle was crying. Mary then dragged Michelle across the yard to a tub filled with rainwater. He says Mary put Michelle into the rinse tub and held her underwater and would bring her up only for Michelle to gasp, cry, and beg her to stop. Mary then took Michelle by the hand and took her into the kitchen where the beating escalated. George says that Mary made Michelle lay down on her back and said if she didn't tell the truth, Mary would stomp on her until she did. Michelle would tell the same story and Mary would stomp on her chest with her shoes. This happened multiple times, and George said every time Mary did, Michelle's arms would bounce up like a rag doll. That night at dinner, George says he remembers Michelle threw up onto her dinner plate. and There were clots of blood in it. Bill, Michelle and George's father, seemed shocked and asked Mary what was wrong with Michelle. George says the adults left the room for a moment, and on her way out, Mary stopped and gave Michelle instructions to finish her dinner. Michelle looked to her brother and started crying again, and said she didn't want to eat the dinner she just threw up all over. George told her she had to, or she knew what Mary would do to them. The next day, Michelle said she felt dizzy and nauseous, and she went to bed and stopped breathing. Michelle was rushed to the emergency room of the Air Force Base, 
and unfortunately, this is where she passed away at 2.20 in the afternoon on August 10th. George never told anyone what happened, as he believed no one would believe him. Rick Stone asked George why he was breaking his silence now, expecting some kind of plea deal. And George outright said he didn't want a deal. He just wanted justice for his sister. This led the investigators to believe George must be telling the truth, because who in prison doesn't want something for information? But then they had a new problem. How do you get evidence to back up the story that's almost 35 years old? Fortunately, the military base where Michelle's autopsy was performed is the same location where she passed away, and this was a definite benefit to the case since military hospitals do not destroy their records. The autopsy report, performed by Dr. Brian Harold, who was a captain in the Air Force at the time, showed hemorrhaging, torn ligaments, and multiple bruises. It concluded that she had died from intra-abdominal bleeding caused by massive trauma to the chest and not viral pneumonia like the death certificate said. When the investigators tracked the doctor down, who was working in Florida, they were surprised that he said he'd been waiting for over 30 years for that phone call. The doctor confirmed what George reported, which is that Michelle's injuries were conducive to the square-heeled shoes that Mary was wearing when she stomped Michelle to death. Strangely, in 1964, the Air Force followed up on Dr. Harold's suspicion of child abuse, saying that her injuries could be an example of battered child syndrome. But because Michelle was a civilian, the local prosecutor declined to pursue it. The death certificate and its attached case sat dormant until 1976, when it was written that she died from viral pneumonia, signed on January 29, 1976, and was filed. In December of 1996, Detectives made the decision to exhume the body of four-year-old Michelle Morgan to see if perhaps her bones would tell a similar story to her autopsy and the testimony from George. What they discovered was nothing short of horrifying. Dr. Janice Ophoven, a forensic pathologist, says it was obvious she had been hurt all over based on remnants of injuries to her face. She also may have had to have gotten plastic surgery at some point in her future to rectify some of the damage. She had signs of her nose being broken and multiple injuries to the back of her head. She had healing fractures of two of her ribs and a significant healing fraction to her left upper arm. The detectives went to the archives and discovered that in Michelle's four short years, she had been to the hospital 20 times for varying injuries, including a laceration of her scalp on October 17, 1960, an abrasion on her forehead on November 28, 1960. She had burns on her scalp, back, and right side from December of 1960, but no medical care was sought, and they were discovered when she was in the hospital on January 8, 1960, when she came in for a fracture of her left humerus near her elbow, stating that she had fallen down four steps on January 7th, or maybe it was when she received a lip injury from supposedly falling off her tricycle in mid-December, or possibly from falling off her tricycle again two days before her admittance on January 7th. I just want to take a second here and say, I haven't seen a lot of kids fall off tricycles. Like, they're purposely built so that you don't fall off of them. Um, But it was enough for cold case detectives to track down Michelle's stepmother, Mary Morgan. They found her in West Columbia, Texas, and still married to Michelle's father. She had since started a family of her own, and she had two boys and two girls. When the detectives arrived and began asking her questions about Michelle... She consistently fell back into, "Mm, I don't remember, or claiming to not know about injuries, such as broken ribs. She claimed she didn't even remember Michelle being in the hospital for a 30-day stint. Shortly after their visit, the detectives received a call from a reporter who had parked himself in front of the Morgan home in Texas. He called to report that the Morgans were throwing stuff into their van with a clear intent to leave. In Montgomery County, Texas, Bill and Mary were pulled over. They claimed to be headed towards Illinois to talk to an attorney. The authorities didn't believe it, and Mary Morgan was arrested, where she ended up pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Her bail was set for a million dollars. She posted bail and served under house arrest until her trial. At the trial, her four children stood behind their mother in court, refusing to believe that she had anything to do with the death of an innocent child. However, detectives additionally uncovered and presented in court that between her four children, 
they themselves had visited the hospital over 150 times before the age of five. Mary Morgan was sentenced to just five years in an Illinois state prison for the death of Michelle. There seems to be no other information aside from the fact that she was released in 2001. I can't even find if she is still alive at this point, but if she were, she'd be 81 years old. There is nothing more upsetting than a parent or a step parent who treats their child in this way. There is nothing about this case that is okay, up to and including the fact that she only served for five years for this horrific crime that she admitted to doing. Child abuse can be physical, sexual, or emotional. Neglect, which is the failure to provide for a child's basic physical and emotional needs, is also a form of child abuse. In homes where child abuse occurs, fear, instability, and confusion may end up replacing the love, comfort, and nurturing that children need. And although child abuse may not always lead to serious physical injury, like Michelle, it often results in serious emotional harm and may have long-lasting effects. Child abuse is also seldom a single event. It usually occurs with regularity, often increasing in severity and in conjunction with other types of ne abuse and neglect. Child abuse happens in every community. It crosses all boundaries of economics, race, ethnicity, and religion. Most often the abuser has a close relationship with the child, such as a parent, step-parent, or another caregiver, but sometimes it does happen by a stranger as well. If a child tells you that he or she has been abused, one of the most important things you can do is stay calm and call the Child Help National Abuse Hotline. Crisis counselors are available to speak 24 hours a day, and you can reach them at 1-800-422-4453, or you can visit childhelp.org. Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.